There's a lot of research now, and I'm sure you've seen it, that these social media platforms with their algorithms and interval ratio reward systems and all are designed to be addictive. Yes. And they do become addictive. You say one of the biggest mistakes we make in a relationship with our children is that we presume ownership over them. I'm really curious, and I have an opinion about this that I'll express too, but I want to know yours. Do you think this generation of children, and by that I mean those that are now, I guess it probably cuts across two generations, but those that are starting into the primary grades of school up through college are being too coddled and protected by parents and then by extension teachers and professors now? Or do you think they're just smoothing the way for them? Too coddled or are they just trying to help them make it through? Well, I think they are being too coddled, but not just by a parent, a singular parent. I think as a reaction from us, from our generation, where we waited for the bus, where we waited uh, for our, we had to go get our own food delivered. You know, we had to go and do the delivery ourselves. We never had this, you know, door to door service. We didn't have Uber and Uber Eats and everything on our fingertips. I think we have created, our generation has now created all these apps or allowed them to come into fruition. And now our children have instant gratification and they can order their perfect meal at the age of eight all by the click of their these buttons on their phone. I think all of this has created an indulgence of material possessions and luxuries that have created a lethargy in our physical and emotional stamina. So we literally have no stamina. I mean, I watch my 20-year-old daughter have an epileptic fit almost if her Uber Eats driver made, got the wrong order. And I look at her absolutely flabbergasted, but knowing I am part of this creation where she cannot tolerate a bad order. And I tell her, get off your butt and cook your own food. How about that? Yeah. But I have done this. I, I have to take ownership, right? So our generation is quick to demean and slander this new generation as being too entitled and coddled, but we were part of this. Well, of course we are. I hear parents talk about the younger generation as though they had nothing to do with it, which is astounding to me. But I guess it was 2008 or 2009. I think about it as though big cargo planes flew over the United States and dropped millions of smartphones (laughs) all over the country. And at that point, there was a shift. And the shift was that these young people stopped living their lives so much as they spent time watching others live their lives. Yes. The lives they're watching being lived aren't real. They're these fantasy lives that these influencers and all are putting up on the internet, and they compare themselves to that. And by comparison, they come out on the short end of the stick because, as I say, those are fantasy lives. They've started getting their driver's license later. And you know all this. I'm just repeating it for our viewers in case they don't know. They're starting to get their driver's license later. They're starting to date later. They have fewer friends. Their interaction with the real world truly is being crowded out by their involvement in the virtual world. And they'll say, oh, I, I met him and we've been dating. And then it's 10 minutes into the conversation where I find out they never met him at all. They call that know. meeting somebody. They never met. It's all on the internet. Right, what is right. up with this? Right. Or a child will say, you know, this person was so mean to me and I'll be thinking in real life, like somebody was really hurting them in real life. And then I'll find out later it was because they didn't like a comment or they sent the wrong emoji. And, uh, you know, so listen, what we're saying is we can go on and on about these crazy kids today. But what we're really saying is that we are watching a crisis unfold and we parents more than ever need to show up in a different way. It was hard enough for you and I to be present with our kids. Talk about the distractions that parents have today. I watch nanny after nanny 
parent after parent it, w- walking their kids in the stroller on their phone. And I watch myself on my phone. So this is not to pr- uh, appear sanctimonious, but we are all in a crisis of attention and presence. And that's why I integrate spirituality and meditation in all my teachings and the principles of presence, because that is what is the missing ingredient. Because when you're present, you're paying attention. When you're paying attention, you're attuning and you're readily available for your children as they need you versus you projecting onto them in a distracted way or a traumatized way. So all of this work to be a parent more now than ever requires more energy and more consciousness from the parent. And you put a lot of this on the parent, and I think almost all belongs on the parent. Of course, the kid has choices to make and all, but as I say, I think we really write on the slate of who they are. We color their personality by what we allow them to do, what we reward, what we fail to reward. I think you're so right, and that's why I love this concept of the conscious parenting. I did a show on New Year's resolutions, which I'm not big on New Year's resolutions, but I think any time for any reason that you stop and say, okay, let me call time out here and focus on what it is that I want to achieve or do, whether it's March 18th or July 14th or whenever it is. I think it's always great if you stop and do that. But people ask me if I would recommend a resolution to somebody. And I said, yeah, I would, but it wouldn't be losing weight or exercising more or changing jobs or blah, 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 blah. It would simply be, be who you are on purpose. Mm -hmm. Don't just wake up every day and react to what's coming through your front door or your phone or happening at work, but Be who you are, do what you do, choose what you choose on purpose. That's what you're saying about parenting is consciously choose what you're doing as a parent. Do this on purpose. Think about it. Consciously choose it and recognize that what I've said forever and ever is when you choose the behavior, you choose the consequences. We're seeing these consequences obtain in these children's lives later and later. Is it ever too late for a parent to change the way they're interacting with and parenting their child? No, of course not, because every new moment with your child is a new opportunity to uh, forge a bond and a connection and to apologize and to take accountability. However, that adult child now is kind of you know, developed. So if we are looking to influence again, it's those early 10, 15 years, and I'm being generous here, um, to, to really do the work. And I often tell parents, please do not have children if you don't understand that you are not having them so you feel better about yourself. You're not having them to show off on Facebook. This is not a trinket, a trophy, or a prize, or one more medal. This has nothing to do with you. This has to do with you willing to go on this adventure, to raise this spirit as they need to be, not as you think they should be or uh, how your parents did it. You have to really tailor the approach very intentionally. But in order to do that, you have to have attention, you have to have intention, you have to have focus, you have to have presence, which means you have to really be there. You know, many times parents will say, oh, you know, I have three children or four children, and I often say, why? Why do you have so many children if, you, if you're so overwhelmed and so stressed? And they'll say, well, I had these children so my first child could have a family, could have siblings. <laughs> Never mind that's mayhem in the house and the first child could, you know, be bothered with the other children. Now the parent is in, you know, in a tizzy because these children don't get along. And I often tell parents that we start the parenting journey on such a misconception You're not having children for any reason. It shouldn't be for any reason, except that you've decided that you're willing to raise this being as they need to be. Don't do your older child a favor. Don't do your grandparents a favor. Don't do your husband a favor or your partner. 
do it because you understand what it takes. And what it takes is, it's not going to be pretty for your ego. It has to be for that child's essence. Yeah, and that really takes some forethought. I know now we see our birth rate dropping down to really dangerous levels as far as this country is going in terms of sustaining. So everybody's wanting people to have children, but you really have to think about this before you do it because there's nothing involved in proper parenting except sacrifice. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of rewards, of course, but it's sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Is there a time in your mind when parents have the opportunity to, I guess, reparent? As you said, when these kids get up to a certain age, you've done what you're going to do, and it's going to be when they're adults, certainly, or when they're going to start to have their own children, those first seven to 10 years, that ship has sailed. Is there benefit in sitting down with a child in the later years and saying, I made a mistake. I did some things that I could have done a better job on, and I don't want you to proliferate that generationally. I want to talk to you about that now and redefine our relationship. And I call that reparenting sometimes instead of just continuing on the journey. Is that worthwhile? Oh, my goodness. It's so amazing and profoundly transformational. If a parent can do that and if the child will give them the audience to do that. Just the other day, I had to publicly declare an apology to my child because she was going on and on in front of other people about how I traumatized her. And I I knew I had messed her up a little bit, but not my goodness. She was acting like I had traumatized her. But instead of getting defensive, I just said, you know, I was just ridiculously pushy and I publicly declare an apology. And she said, you're forgiven. But children, children need that, you know, and we parents get so defensive. But that was their experience. The way she told the story and the way adult children will tell their story about your parenting will be very different than how you remembered it. And oh often we parents so different and they remember every Every mistake, right? They will not remember all the good times that all the times you salvaged the situation and showed up. They will remember your unconscious moments. But that's such a beautiful thing because what that means is that they're still holding some pain around that and they're asking to be validated. And the fact that they bring it up in adulthood, as annoying as it is and as, you know, short changed in terms of memory and it's just, you know, their own story being told It's a powerful opportunity for parents to take that moment to heal and to say, you know what? I may see it differently, but I hear you. I see that you're still holding a grudge and you're really in pain about my unconsciousness. And I was foolish. And I I really want to tell you that I apologize for hurting you. It doesn't take anything for us to do that. But some parents will just not do it because they get so defensive, which is the reason why the child is still holding on to that grudge. So reparenting is an endless opportunity to heal, to take accountability, to release your child of their grudges. What a wonderful thing if we can do that for our children. 